Hello everybody, what is up? This is K-Rail. This is my living room and we are in beautiful Park City, Utah. Well, we all aren't. I am. And we're going to do a little live today with my good friend Mark Testa and we are going to talk about a very important subject that cannot get enough attention in my opinion, which is called belly fat. Yes, midsection abdominal fat. We're going to go into the nuts and bolts of it why people accumulate it, how to get rid of it, why you don't want it in your system, and what kind of havoc it can wreak on your body, inside and out, and mentally as well. But before we get there, I must do an exercise because it's time for a movement break. Every two hours, movement break throughout the day. Don't forget that. That is absolutely quintessential. When you are sitting at a desk, it is even more important than if you lead an active lifestyle. But because we're going to be talking about abdominal fat, I think it's only apropos that I show you an ab abdominal exercise that you can do right from the comfort of your home. Now on a scale of one to 10 of intensity, I'm gonna put this at about a seven or eight, maybe even a nine. It's one of my specialty exercises and I call it a derailer. So anytime there's an exercise that has my name attached to it, I guarantee you it's gonna be an intense one. This is a highly skilled drill, remember that. So if you can't pull this off right from the start, I totally understand. There's a couple different variations you can do as well, which I'm not gonna go into the whole nuts and bolts, but I'm gonna give you a quick Yes or no on those. All right, are you ready? I'm gonna jump back there where I have a little more space. I may have to adjust my camera, so bear with me for two seconds. Here we go. This is called a derailer. I think I'm in frame. I'm sort of in frame, but I'm really long and we have to shoot in a portrait, so bear with me. So what we're gonna do is come into a side leaning rest position. We're gonna stack our legs on top of each other. This is my right leg. It's gonna look like my left leg when you're watching me. I'm gonna extend this leg up in the air so it's parallel to the floor. I'm gonna take this hand, placed on the side of my head. Now I'm gonna hold this position as I bring my knee to my elbow and then I'm gonna extend this leg back out. So we're gonna go back and forth, slow and controlled, just like this. See how fun this is? Whew. Now, that is called the derailer. Yes, derail, rail, get it? Ha <laughs> ha, funny. Now if you can't pull that off, you can reduce your body down to a forearm and do it this way, much easier. If that's too challenging, take your shin and place it on the ground and stick this leg up. Oh, looky there. Zero excuses left. Okay? So if you're a novice, start where I ended. If you're advanced, start where I started. And if you're somewhere in between, do the one I did in the middle. There, I just covered all bases. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm out of breath. Let me sit down. Okay, we're ready. We're going to take a big deep breath on three. One, two, three. Big inhale. Exhale. Good. Didn't that feel good? Felt great for me. Oh yeah, I can feel the chi particles floating in the air right now here in Park City. Hopefully they're coming out to you. All right, let me get Mark on the line. I see he's here. He's waiting for me. Hold on, Mark. I'm coming, getting you right now. I got to hit approve. There, your protection in. Hopefully I can fit it on my stand here. Derailer. Ten. Woo. How's I like that. I'm I good, man. I don't think I ever showed you that one when I was out in Denver. But yeah, that's, that's a, a that's a killer, killer. Obliques. Oh yeah, it gets the whole shebang down there. Yeah. All three areas of the abdominal wall, but right. We can go a little more into that later on. But the more important factor, hey John, how's it going? The more important factor here today is we are going to be talking about belly fat, abdominal fat, that fun flagellomic goo that a lot of us build up right in the midsection over the course of time. Now, as a health and fitness professional of 20 plus years, I have seen every trick in the book, every lick in the book, every infomercial in the book, every fitness gadget, everything known to man about spot reduction. Yeah. And it's all a bunch of garbage. It is it's laughable and it's ridiculous. Good to see you too, John. I'll be seeing you when I get to the East Coast in a couple of weeks. So, Mark Testa, Dr. Mark <laughs> Testa, yeah. be your own doctor. Be tell, me, tell me something. What is your take on abdominal fat? Let's just call it abdominal fat. Let's be like scientific for a minute. Central adiposity. Central adiposity. I love the word adiposity. I say that sometimes. People are like, uh, her? what? Out of you, what? You know another name for it that is what? used? The panis. Panis. The, the panis? Panis. P-A-N-U-S. That's, I've never even heard that one. Oh, I got a couple stories about a panis I'll tell you about later. Oh, <laughs> Central I'll, adiposity. I'll it is like, it, look, 
you don't need lab tests to know if you're not going to age well or get diabetes or have a heart attack. All you got to do is lift up your shirt because that belly fat yeah. is a huge risk factor for diabetes. It's a huge risk factor for cardiovascular disease, hypertension, erectile dysfunction. I mean, that thing, it's got a life of its own that is not leading anyone to health at all. And, you know, it's interesting because we were at a, um, uh, a Colorado, um, um, what the hell is the word I'm looking for? Conference? No, Seminar, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere where you go to soak in water, hot springs. Thank oh. you. And I'm like, just looking around and I'm thinking, you know, we have in we, we have just accepted obesity as normal in America nowadays. Nobody even bats an eye about covering it up anymore. And that belly fat among men and women is just a detrimental. It's just a detriment. Right. And I learned yeah. this week, actually, that some of the fat from there gets into the portal circulation and goes right to the liver. So mm -hmm. it gets recycled and causing, you know, increasing fatty liver disease and uh, non-alcoholic steatoresis and just bad stuff to the liver. Now uh, contributing to one of the number one reasons for liver transplant. I mean, that Ooh. is a big deal. Cirrhosis and liver deal. transplant. Yeah, yeah, so this belly fat, I mean, I know I've been talking a lot about it this week, particularly to men, um, because so many people, you know, want to, you know, fix their libido, fix their erectile dysfunction with a blue pill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a band-aid. Band it's, band it's, it's masking the symptoms, the internal strife that's going on. And, you know, the, 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 the health risk of belly fat is predominantly talked about with men because men are more predisposed to, to gain weight in their stomach and their sides. However, women are equally as prone to chronic disease from the excess belly fat as men. The Harvard University in general, or specifically that I've read study, studies from, claim that it increases their risk for heart attack, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and breast cancer by having adiposity in the stomach. So any women that are out there watching, or if any of you know women out there that are looking to change their ways and clean up their diets or get back in shape and lose abdominal fat, I highly encourage you to highly motivate them to do so because you're just as ri at risk for, for disease and conditions as men are. I'll wait till the siren goes by. Sorry, I'm at the hospital this oh, morning. Oh, that's all right, I get it. <laughs> but, but not to mention that the subcutaneous fat which you have just under the layer of your skin, that's, that's benign. It's, it may be uncomfortable, it may be frustrating, and it may not feel good when you wear a bathing suit, but it's not gonna kill you. The stomach and the centralized area, the, uh, the fat in the stomach area, the centralized area is called visceral fat, deep fat. It packs around your organs. Any kind of fat that packs around your organs is bad news to start with. But couple it with what Mark was saying earlier, and then you have a toxic environment that it creates. It literally creates toxins in your system, which makes things even worse. So it you know, spiral out of control even more so than just the emotional effects that it causes. Yeah, there's another piece that gets overlooked, the emotional uh, effects of it and, you know, the energy and the relationships. And, you know, it's, it's a far reaching um, uh, concern, certainly. And, you know, I mentioned uh, libido and erectile dysfunction, you know, particularly in men. But interestingly, I heard a great lecture recently, the same things affect the female uh, sex organs as they do the male sex organ with as you're saying, the toxins, the inflammatory chemicals that are released from fat um, affect the, the, the clitoris like it does the penis. And, and it causes, you know, um, microcirculation disruption. And when that gets disrupted, the tissue, the normal erectile tissue in those organs becomes fibrotic. So you could potentially permanently lose the function of the organ um, because the, the, the blood vessel is now filled with fibrosis and, and, and adhesions and scar tissue and just, it, it's not the same tissue. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think just, you know, and, I, and, and look, this might sound bad. I don't think accepting this as a new normal is a benefit to anybody. I mean- I just, I know, totally agree. Yeah, 
you know, with health care at three and a half trillion dollars this year, trillion um, with no real end in sight. Uh, you know, I think some of the solutions that we're going to talk about here today and ways for people to get this under control uh, are prudent and necessary because that three and a half trillion dollars, you know, I'm paying it and you're paying it. And yeah. I don't know about you, but my insurance rates are going up and I have crappy health insurance. I pretty much do too, but the same exact <laughs> thing's happening. I'm yeah. sure my friend John Harrison watching is paying it too. <laughs> Because he's a healthcare professional as well. And yeah. we all see it. And we see the trickle-down effect. And what you're describing really hits home with me. And it's like the whole, um, you know, I, I, I would say that 50% of the time when I go out anymore and hang out with people, the complete adverse is happening. People always complain about fat shaming. But there is, the fat shaming has kind of turned around. And it's now fit shaming. Although it's, it, this is an ironic twist of fate, Mark. I see how big that fitness industry has come as a whole. Like CrossFit is still huge. Spin-off workouts similar to CrossFit. All these like, there's this thing called- Orange F45. Theory. Orange yeah. Theory, yeah. All these things are, are popping up left and right faster than you can bat an eyelash. However, our healthcare costs are still through the roof. The obesity epidemic is still very high. And people are now like, like the focus has completely shifted to, I'm big and beautiful and that's it. And I'm gonna eat my donuts and screw you to me and other people like me. And that's in a story, and they're not going to have anything to do with it. And they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to see about it. And I feel fit-shamed often. Fit-shamed. I know that sounds crazy, but I'll go to a party with like 10 or 15 people, all of which are drinking tons and tons of alcohol and eating really heavy doses of, of caloric foods. And I'll be over there with my salad, like a rabbit in the corner of the room. And people look at me and stare at me and try to get me to drink and try to get me to eat this and try to do, get me to do that and go out to late hours in the morning and eat late at night and all these other things. And when I refuse it, all of a sudden I'm being fit shamed and I feel like an outsider. I feel like an outcast. I feel alienated and I feel suicidal. Like why am I even on this earth anymore? And I mean, it's crazy how those thoughts even come into my head. I'm being hypothetical here. I'm not actually suicidal, but you know what I'm getting at? And it's like the whole entire perception has completely changed in the universe. I don't understand what's happened. So it's like, yeah. if you go the good direction, if you go the good path, you're being absconded and you're looked down upon. And if you go this wide open path where everyone's welcome to join you, you're totally accepted. But yeah. it's the narrow path that is the one that I'm taking. And it's the one with all the broken angles and the sharp cliffs I have to climb over and everything else. But to me, that's the only path I know and it's the one I'm taking. But it's so bizarre how that has happened. It's like yeah. this reverse psychology has occurred. And like... Right. Instead of encouraging people to lose the weight and get in shape, we have lowered the standards again to the army and the more military forces. We've lowered the standard. Physical education in schools is not existent anymore. I mean, when we were going to school, back in elementary, I used to look forward to the President's Council Fitness Award thing, where we had to do a certain amount of pull-ups. We had to run a 50-yard dash in a certain amount of time, and a mile in a certain amount of time, a certain amount of sit-ups and push-ups. I loved it. I looked forward to it. I would spend nine, three quarters of the year practicing all those drills to see how well I can do on that test. And then I don't even think it exists anymore. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. No. Yeah. I, I, it's history as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I get it with you on that. John stays like somebody was uh, uh, telling him that it's not normal to be fit at his age of 43, which is just, it's ridiculous. Um, Dude. I got I got a little of that from my cousin who I hadn't seen in about 30, 30 years as well. And I'm like, well, you know, look, I was 50 pounds heavier and I had fatty I liver and I had yeah. all those. I turned it around because, you know, in my 50s, I turned it around. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was almost like she was giving me a hard time for for doing that. And I'm like, look, yeah. uh, I'm in healthcare. I see the downside of all this. I know what happens. Everybody, you know, it's you know, I wanted to fix it. And so, you know, that's what we want to talk about today. Our fix, yeah. uh, our solution, I think, you know, the 30 years I've been in practice and seeing patients, not quite, but, but, but close. Can't believe it. How'd that happen? <laughs> and you're, I'm you're by fast. similar amount of time. I think, you know, we have put together a lot of good, uh, you know, practical, uh, scientific ways to get things turned around in, in a way that is sustainable. And that's the key, right? Because yeah. I've been, you've seen it, I've seen it, you know, I see people, I'm like, holy cow, like, I didn't recognize you. Would you lose 100 pounds? And then three <laughs> years later, 
I see him, I'm like, holy cow, I didn't recognize you. What'd you do, <laughs> put on 120 pounds? Right, yeah. Because the, 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 the extremes sometimes that people take um, are not sustainable. Yeah. yeah and I think shocking. what we've put together is sustainable. So, um, totally. Yeah. And well, you I, know what? I, I mentioned we talked about this last week, right? People who lose weight, only three to five percent have uh, keep it off for over a year. Mm -hmm. Right. That is staggering, staggering. That that tells you, you know, Weight Watchers, whatever, uh, Jenny Craig, um, whatever you're doing is not working and and, and is well, just a, a, a flash in the pan. Yeah, I think I think the whole topic of like those pre-made diet plans, that, that's a whole other that's a whole other uh, Facebook live for us to discuss. Cause I've got a lot of stuff to say on that. I know you do as well, yeah. but I do want, I do want to give kudos to John though, because he's, if John, if you're still listening and correct me if I'm wrong, but you came from a spot of, of being overweight and you lost a ton of weight and you got into great shape. And he's like, he's one of the most talented fitness guys I know right now in the industry. John, he's very well schooled with kettlebells. He's, he does, he moves like a, a gazelle. And um, I've watched, I kind of watched some of his backstory before I met him in person. And I was, I was very impressed with that. And he's been able to keep, um, you know, obviously his weight off and, and he's his high fitness levels. So it's very awesome to watch that in motion where the other side of the coin goes, where people do it correctly. They do it smartly and they stay where they should be. But yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the solution, Mark. What is like the first thing people can do? Well, when to eat. When to, when eat, to eat, right? That's when, when, we're, that, that, when, when do you eat? When should you eat? When to eat is where I start, where we start everybody, people that work with us who come in who are not fat adapted. And everything we're going to talk about here today is does two things, really. It gets you fat adapted, meaning it trains your body to burn fat and it burns the fat off your body. So, um, so becoming fat adapted burns the fat off your body, but it also, you know, we're going to have, we, we have people learn how to re-engage with food. So when to eat, I think is the most important, basic, easy thing to do. And it follows what comes out of uh, uh, the Salk Institute, Sash and Panda's lab, eating with your circadian rhythm mm -hmm. and being done eating, you know, you know, me three hours before bed and eating in a window of time of maybe, you know, six to eight hours a day and eating with the circadian rhythm, the, with the way the sun moves, the way our cells work, the way biology works mm -hmm. in our body and aligning our eating with that biology. So th that is step number one. And it's interesting, you know, when we start with people, we have them start with a 12-12, right? Eat for 12 yeah. hours, fast mm -hmm. for 12 hours. Most right. of that time, you're sleeping. Correct. And Which is a piece of cake. That's well, you're it's asleep. Like, it's like me saying to someone, I, I want you to do this for me. I want you to exercise 30 minutes a day, every day of the week, and you can do whatever you want as long as it's scheduled exercise, and you can even do it in two or three chunk increments of time. Can you do that for me? And them saying, oh, 30 minutes, I can't do it. I'd be like, you're lying to my face. You can do 30 minutes a day. And it, that is, as, to me, that's, that's as pathetically easy and simple as the 12-hour fasting protocol with eating three meals and no snacks in between. And by the way, I need to say two things. First of all, um, John, I'm going to confirm this. He actually just sent in a message, and he lost 100 pounds 10 years ago. Very that's awesome. amazing. Yeah, that that's is. Awesome. Yeah. And, and it's like I get inspired from colleagues like him. <laughs> it inspires me. I'm like, man, he lost 100 pounds. I mean, I've never had to deal with weight gain like that in my life. I've never been that out of, out of tune, out of shape. I mean, I used to eat junk food late at night. I used to do all those break the rules with like six meals a day and all that. But I, I only had like residual fat. I never was that far behind the eight ball. And I can't imagine what it's like to live life 100 pounds heavier than I am right now. And John's about my size right now. And he's, he's like solid as a rock and built. He looks great. So to lose, 10, to lose 100 pounds and maintain that for 10 years, we commend you, John. Great job on that. Absolutely. That's yeah. great. So, so yeah, back when, when to eat. So, yeah. yeah, so so starting, you know, if this is new to you, um, it might be uncomfortable at first. And it's uh, here's why it's uncomfortable, because your body does not know how to burn fat. It mm -hmm. only knows how to burn sugar or glucose. Yeah. And so, you know, you're going to feel this like, oh, my God, I'm tired. I'm so sleepy. I'm so hungry. I can't do it. Yeah. Baloney. 
<laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> go Take to sleep. <laughs> Because that's the sign that you're on the road, on the wrong road. You're sugar um, adapted and not fat adapted. I think it was, yeah. was it Dr. Klum that was talking about this a couple of weeks ago at the seminar? Yeah. Was it him? Because I was listening I to so. it this morning and, and it was, yeah. I was just like shaking my head up and down. Yep. And he was talking about the signs of knowing if you're fat adapted or sugar adapted. And one of the signs is if you eat a meal and you get really lethargic right afterward, you're most likely sugar adapted, not fat adapted. It's not giving you proper energy or fuel. Like I just had my first meal right before we started this and I'm like, my energy is through the roof right now. So I guess that's a good sign. And I, I know I'm fat adapted because I've been working out in the fastest state for so long. We'll get to, we'll get to exercise yeah. in a minute. But I have another question. When, you mean I can't get one of those ab gadgets and just like crunch my way to, to, to lean your stomach? No, what I, I would get- I uh, what I would get is the thing that you put around your belly to just oh, sweat right there. That, that's a that, better one. That's the one how that, you do it. What about that one that gives you like the shock waves? It causes my muscles to contract. That one that put it in too. my belly fat? No, put it under your, put it under your uh, sweat shirt? suit thing there. <laughs> my sauna suit. <laughs> and get a bigger I, shirt. That's a great idea. I'll get a sauna suit and I'll get one of those abdominizers, whatever they're called. So I can just sit in the chair all day and let that thing work for me. Well, I'm eating my bucket of ice cream and popcorn at the same time. No, no, well, that, that won't, won't work. work. But oh, you know why? God. So a couple reasons, and this is why it's so important to when to eat is so important. So start out with 12 hours. Get your body used to that for a period of time. If it takes a week or two weeks, so be it. And then increase that to uh, 11 hours of, uh, or I'm sorry, 13 hours of fasting and then 14 hours of fasting. And really in the studies, and some of them are mouse studies, some of them are human studies, they all show that the longer you can do time-restricted feeding throughout the day, the better the benefits. And what are the mm -hmm. benefits? Decrease in inflammation, decrease mm -hmm. in weight, improvement mm -hmm. of glucose levels, uh, um, fasting glucose, improvement of insulin levels, right? These things brain all function. improve. Yeah, brain function, sleep. Eye function, all of it. So when you, you fast for that, those periods of time throughout the day, and that's the way we used to be anyway. You don't even have to go back to caveman. I talked to my 90-year-old aunt about wow. it, and I said, so what would you guys do in the morning? How would you eat? What would you do? And, you know, they, they were farmers, so they dealt with the farm early, right? You start milking cows and, and chickens early. You don't go to the kitchen and make up a big breakfast. You deal with, you know, your livelihood first, and then you come in and eat and, um, and so they didn't eat right out of bed. And so when did you, when did you stop eating? Well, because we didn't, you know, have the luxury of lights and refrigeration during, like we do now, we were generally done eating really early because we had to deal with nature, right? Mm -hmm. Back to the circadian rhythm. And right. so what, what, what did you eat? Well, they were Italian immigrants. They made a lot of their food. They had a greenhouse for the winter months because we grew up in Ohio. They moved from Italy to Ohio. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> because and, Ohio is so beautiful. I mean, so haven't beautiful. you been there? It's oh, gorgeous. All yeah. those corn stalks and those flat fields, and they're so brown all year round. <laughs> beautiful. Who wouldn't want to move to Italy with all those, those big rolling hills and beautiful buildings? Who'd want to move? Yeah. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. Sorry. No so, offense to anyone from Ohio. So, uh, so, um, so yeah. So they, they had to work with that, right? And they didn't, and they didn't have the luxury, you know, they might've butchered a cow, but they had to stretch that thing out. So they didn't have the luxury of, and so she's 90 and she's, she looks like she's 70. She's wow, not overweight. Fantastic. She does, has no health problems. And her brother, 95, right? His muscles are weak, but mentally he's there. He has no prostate issues. No, he's on no medications. I just saw him this summer. I was like, what? The, that's amazing. Jeez. Right. And it was all because they just naturally worked with nature. And mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and so back to, um, you know, extending when that to fast, eat. when to yeah. eat, Ex extend it, extend it, extend it. And I think it's safe for most people to go 14 to 16 hours a day without food. Uh, you mm -hmm. broke your fast. I just broke mine. Well, well, I don't even know with the fast bar. Oh, the fast bar. Those are delicious from Prolon and yeah. you know, this thing, um, uh, the way the macros are designed in it, my body still thinks it's fasting from last night. So I got some micronutrients in and, and a few macronutrients with uh, very low protein carbs. Um, uh, and my body still thinks it's fasting. So there are, if you need a, a, a little hack around things, but the, but the bottom line is I, I could go 24 hours 
you know, a day without eating. That's super not cool. That, not that we're recommending that. So, well, yeah. Well, we'll get to how to eat, which we'll talk about well, going 24. Before we, before we even get to how to eat, um, I think it's, especially since you just flashed that bar into our faces and made everyone out there who's fasting hungry, <laughs> which I doubt there's any. Um, <laughs> let's, go, let's address the question of what to eat. Yeah. What? I'm, I, what? I just, I, I want to lose 50 pounds. I am uh, I, I'm a postal worker. I drive a, a truck for the postal service and I drive it from point A to point B all day long, back and forth. I just shuttle mail. I'm 50 pounds overweight. I don't get much physical activity other than like stopping for a bathroom break here and there. I want to start doing fasting. I want to lose $50. Uh, what, $50. No, I want to gain $1,000 a day. I want to lose 50 pounds. You just told me when to eat. Okay, I'm going to start eating between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. tomorrow. What do I eat? Right. So right, we've said this. There's no one diet. There's only mm -hmm. one you. So sort of the guideline, the guidepost that, I, that you know, we steer people is this 80-20 whole food plant-centric diet with 20% animal protein that see, and, and if you need to lose 50 pounds and you need to restrict carbohydrates. And I really believe that makes a big difference. Uh, we just attended a, uh, a low carb conference here in Colorado and I went in sort of skeptical, like, I'm going to find flaws in this bull, but yeah. I can I came out of there, you know, there's a lot of clinicians, there's a lot of doctors taking care of human beings that are getting amazing results with this kind of a diet. Call it a keto diet, call it a low carb diet. But I think if you're really overweight, it's very important to restrict carbohydrates. And yes, fruit. fruit. <laughs> Don't just stick your finger in my face. I love my, no, seriously, I, I barely, that, that, we'll get into like the nuances of only eating two meals a day and the benefits of those down the road. But what, one of the benefits to me is the fact that I could eat fruit and that it doesn't even scratch me because I'm only eating two meals a day. And I don't eat a ton of fruit either. My first meal just now, I take two really ripe bananas. I chop them up. I put them in a bowl. And I add like a million ingredients. Hemp protein powder, greens powder, seeds, nuts. Um, I put a little bit of coconut nectar in it. I put some pine pollen in there. And I put some maca in there and mix it all together into this mush. And it is mm. absolutely amazing. Pistachios and some nuts and stuff. But go ahead and continue. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just get excited sometimes. Yeah, no, that, that's <laughs> Please good. forgive my Tourette's. <laughs> it jumps so, up sometimes. So, so the 80-20 whole food plant-based diet, right? So 20% yeah, of 21 meals, right? We're going to talk about two meals a day in a minute, but 21 uh, of 20% of 21 meals is like four meals a week of animal protein. And I really do... To a large degree, I think we need some animal protein in our diet for... Um, reasons uh, of b12 of carnitine of of things uh, like that uh, of enough amino acids in particular um uh leucine and methionine which drive certain functions now they don't our body doesn't need that stuff 24 7 right. um but it does need some and and if i go back to my chinese medicine training you know the yang energy you know the yin yang uh, right. So I remember my teacher saying, like, when you're sick, when you're like injured, when you've got broken bones, when you've got open flesh, you need to yeah. eat flesh, right, to heal. Yeah. And and and, and that they believe the energy and or the energy transfers to our energy. And 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 having taken care of people for a long time, I took care of plenty of sick vegans and vegetarians when I lived in Boulder, when I practiced in Boulder. And the one thing they needed was one some sort of young energy and two, some, some animal protein. So look, if you don't agree with that, that's okay too. But mm -hmm. that's where we tend to steer people because again, Kevin and I have been taking care of people for a long time. When you say to somebody who's 50 pounds overweight, got to be a vegan, they're not going to do it. Or yeah. you got to be a vegetarian, they're not going to do it. So I'd rather take small incremental steps and get people moving in the right directions. So um, 80, 20. So, you know, uh, low carb vegetables, right? Not potatoes yet mm -hmm. for you, for you that wants to lose 50 pounds, not <laughs> potatoes, but broccoli, mm -hmm. cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprout. It's yeah, Brussels. You, you, Did you, you tell me that? I don't know. It's, it's not Brussels sprout. It's Brussels sprout. Brussels sprout? Singular yeah. on the sprout? 
I don't know about singular on the sprout, but I know I it's plural, plural on the Brussels. Yeah, it's Brussels sprout. Brussels sprouts is the okay. actual thing. Okay. It's, it's plural, plural. And uh, you can never go wrong. I need to cut you off for a second. You can never go wrong, folks, when you eat cruciferous vegetables, which is what right. Mark was describing. Yep. Cru um, Brussels, Brussels sprouts are one of my favorites. Cauliflower, broccoli, um, kale, chard, and what's the other heavy hitter there? Cabbage. Garlic and onions, cabbage. Cabbage. All those vegetables, I eat those in, in rotation every single week. And when I say rotation, I do mean I rotate them. So I'll have cauliflower one night, broccoli the next night, cabbage the next night, and then maybe just go bing, bang, boom again, or I'll blend some of them together. But you always want to be diversified with your diet too. We'll get into that in a whole other Facebook Live down the road. But those are always safe. They're, they're dense. They're filling. They're high in fiber. They're high in vitamin C. They're... They, they have indoles in them, which are powerful substances that lower your estradiol levels, which in turn raise your testosterone levels. So when you're in the pursuit of losing belly fat to gain back your manhood down there, you definitely want to get some cruciferous vegetables in your diet by a mile. And if you add a little coconut oil in there, you get some healthy fat as well. And then you're still off to the races because healthy fat is good for you, which helps create positive hormone balance in your body because your hormones rely on healthy fats to be produced in the first place. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but I had to throw that in there because I'm very passionate about my cruciferous vegetables. Yeah, no, that's good. Now, people ask, you know, what about uh, the nightshade plants? Look, if you have arthritis and you have musculoskeletal aches and pains, but if you're overweight, there's so many confounding factors that you, you could take out nightshade plants, which are potatoes, tomatoes, uh, peppers, peppers. Um, tobacco, which you shouldn't be having anyway. <laughs> You shouldn't have that. Um, and you can, you can try to do that. Um, but, you know, let's not take away too many of the good things. Um, again, whole grains, if you're going to do this, but low carb. You can't go and eat, you know, two cups Processed. of pasta yeah. um, um, things. Um, beans, also, though, you got to watch beans. While they're good in a million ways, you can get, uh, sneak in too many carbs from too many beans, but you know, nuts, raw nuts, raw seeds, unsalted, get good oils, get good protein there. Um, th those are the things. And, you know, I, I know I have my go-tos, my go-to breakfast salad, my, my, you know, dinners, my dinner salads, uh, my clean protein and veggies, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, I, I make it awesome um, using cauliflower rice. Uh, oh, love it. I love it. I eat it all the time. I get it down to yeah. Trader Joe's. Yeah. Stir fry. You can make stir mm -hmm. fry. I make hash browns now out of that. And so, um, so there's plenty of food to eat. And then, you know, throw some eggs in there one of the days, get some animal protein one of the days, and feel satiated. And like Kevin's saying, too, good oils, right? Avocado mm -hmm. oil, olive oil, MCT oil, coconut oil. Um, all are very beneficial for I, numerous things. I love um, also hemp oil and especially red palm oil. And once summer starts rolling around, I will be going, I'll be shifting all my oils right to red palm oil. And I won't even think twice. It's one of my favorites. And once summer rolls around, we should probably talk about red palm oil and, and a, diet, a specific diet to help improve um, your body's ability to ward off the evil effects of the sun. Because I have that dialed in. I do it during the summertime. People are always saying to me, wow, you have such a nice tan. You have such a nice tan. I'm like, well, I, I eat properly. And they're like, they look at me twice. Like, what did you just say? I, I, I said, I follow a specific diet that helps. That's very favorable to tanning and protecting your skin from skin cancer at the same time. So all you people that yell at me about not wearing skin sunscreen, I do it for a very specific reason. It's I eat a certain way. I do put some stuff on my, usually on top of my head. I'll put sunscreen on. And then if I'm not going to be outside for more than an hour, I don't even touch sunscreen because it's, it's poisonous. It's damages. It's terrible for the system. I just created a word, by the way. And if you can't pronounce these long words that barely even fit on the label, you shouldn't be putting it on your skin because your skin is the largest organ in the body and it absorbs everything in sight. That's why you have to pee minutes after you go swimming in a swimming pool. And I wouldn't suggest that either because it's loaded with chlorine. Soapbox done might drop on that topic. We'll come back to it a couple months down the road. Now, and, and I think that's probably why some people, well, most Americans are deficient in vitamin D, right? An yeah, adequate we, amount of vitamin D is about mm -hmm. 50 to 100 nanograms per deciliter. And I tell you, I'm not kidding you when I say I measured 100 of them 
one year and I saw like one or two people that were above 30. All the rest were well below 30 and some of them in single digits. And vitamin wow. D is involved in all kinds of different, you know, gut health, uh, colon health, you know, immune system function, lung function, skin. And, and, you know, we go out, we're all clothed up or we put UV stuff, but the, vi the, the sun, the ultraviolet light from the sun converts, um, you know, chemicals in our blood to vitamin D. So, um, yeah. enough, uh, you know. And that's part, of the, that's part of the problem. And it's just like everyone is so germ happy these days with their kids, especially. They, they have like sanitizers and, and, and cleaners and like hand wipes and soap. Wash your hands, wash your hands. Kids aren't getting dirty anymore. And the, the, the health of the kids has gone way downhill since when we were younger. Yeah. We were always filthy dirty. We came in and washed our hands of dirt to eat lunch and we go right back outside. And if we were out playing and, and one of our parents came out with like iced tea and snacks, we would just like <laughs> gobble it right down. There was no washing hands, there was no nothing. We'd roll around in the dirt and we'd get filthy all day long. And everyone's so germ happy anymore. Our body's immunities have become weak and that's why everyone's getting sick. And that's my hypothesis on that. That's right. It goes for the sun. It's like we're so doggone protective of everything. I mean, we used to sit in the back of my dad's pickup truck and we would drive 50 miles away. Me and my brother sit in the wheel wells. He'd be flying. He'd take the wheel and go like this. And we'd be like almost falling out of the truck, laughing our heads off. And we thought it was a big joke. That's not even legal anymore. And we're fine. <laughs> and you know what's so funny about that is I hear you saying that, right? Sunscreens and washing your hands. And yet 50% of Americans are overweight or obese. And that's not really, you know, as addressed or 90 million Americans are pre-diabetic. It's like we're fighting the wrong fights. Um, yeah. Looking at that kind of stuff. And the more we learn about the, the microbiome, the more those dirt microbes are beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, not washing exactly. your hands and like dropping the food in the dirt and <laughs> yeah. eating it anyway, right? Five second rule, right? I five don't even second have, rule. I, I don't have a five second rule. I have like a 10 day rule. If it's not stale, <laughs> if I can clean the junk off, <laughs> right in. I drop stuff on my kitchen floor all the time. But blueberries and like chunks of celery, I'm just like, dust it off and I eat it. If you're out at, outside grilling and you have like an organic hamburger and you will go to flip it and it lands on the ground, you, it's got all this gr gr crud on it. You throw it right back on the grill and you burn it off. Exactly. I've done that, I've done that so many times growing up. It's not even funny. <laughs> Me too. Just go for it. So what so, to eat? 80-20. So, um, and you know, like you mentioned earlier, right? You want to eat your meal within a one hour window and nothing yeah. in between. Eat your meal Ideally. within a one hour window and nothing in between. Mm -hmm. Eat your meal in a one hour window and nothing in between. No caloric drinks, no no snacking, you're not gonna die. Let's get the body fat adapted. And yeah. those, the, you know, so knowing when to eat and even what to eat to, to, to the biggest extent are huge game changers. And we saw that in, our, in our, one of our programs recently where, you know, somebody started losing weight, just cutting it down to 12 hours and sleeping mm -hmm. better. Yeah. So it doesn't take long to make these changes. And I had a client, I might add, who, um was following my guidelines of the, just the simple 12 hour protocol, three meals a day. And she was on, she was this close to getting put on blood pressure medication before I had her starting to do this. And she reported back to me the other day, sent me her a picture of her lab report. The doctor was baffled at how low her numbers were. And he's like, you're, you're like one point away from completely normal right now. And you don't, you don't need medication or anything like that. And she was thrilled. And all she did was a 12 hour fast. There was nothing aggressive about her, nothing hardcore about it. So it works. It's that simple. It's so, it's so simple, and it works at the same time. You can't ask for something better than that. I just got a text uh, from two people that were in our program yesterday. Both of their cholesterols are significantly down, like, you know, into the normal range, Sweet. first time in years. And the one guy, I think I told you, lost 50 pounds. He yeah. kept it off. He's, he's like 175. That's and, amazing. Um, and he's like, this is great. We found the solution. Thank you so much. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. You got to stick to it. That's just, you know, yeah. once you find it. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, so do you need to eat three meals a day? What are your thoughts on that? No. Heck no. I eat two meals a day. Yeah. For the general population, general benefits, baseline benefits, three meals a day is totally fine. If you're looking to lose weight, make those meals modest in calories. If you're aggressively trying to lose weight, then aggressively look at fasting a little more aggressively. And then you want to bunch it up to more of a 14 to 15 hour fast, even 16 hours, and then aim for two meals. These are going to be the ways, like if you really want to get rid of belly, belly fat fast, 
then I would go right to 16 hours, two meals a day, nothing in between, and make sure to finish that last meal by 7 p.m. at night. And that's going to like fire things up big time. You're going to see drastic changes in a hurry. But if you want to just wean your way in and go in slow, 12 hours a day, three meals a day, totally fine and excellent. And I want to talk about the time restricted feeding window. Um, you know, there's early time restricted feeding and late time restricted mm -hmm. feeding. They both seem to really work with weight loss. Early time restricted feeding is, you know, eat your breakfast at eight, eat your lunch at like two and then be done until yeah. the next day. So yeah. that's getting done early. That has been shown, shown a lot of benefits with weight and, uh, and other things that we talked about, inflammation, lipids, things like that. And then there's the late time restricted feeding that works as well. Um, of skipping breakfast and not eating till noon and then mm -hmm. being done by seven. So, um, you know, you can work this around your lifestyle. And remember, this is how our ancestors used to eat. This is, you know, just kind of new to us because we've been, you know, we've had food everywhere around us for so long that we think it's normal to just shove it in all the time. But, mm -hmm. um, but we're seeing bigger, bigger repercussions from just doing that. Yeah. And it's very adaptable. Like you said, that was a good point you made up. Now, all the, on the average, the research that I hear and see all claims that the earlier feeding window is going to trump the later feeding window. However, I don't, feel, I don't feel the later feeding window is going to damage your system or your body. I just feel the first one is more optimal, especially if you're looking to aggressively lose weight and belly fat faster. So like Mark said, if you worked in like a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. window or like 8 to 4 type of a thing you will probably get better benefits of weight loss that direction than shifting it the other way. Now, I go the other direction because of, A, because of my schedule, the way it's set up, and my, mo my mornings are usually the busiest time of my day, so I don't have time to sit down at 8 o'clock and eat a meal. So I leverage my time differently, and I try to close off my eating by, like, 6 p.m. at night, best case scenario. 5 p.m. is, like, super best case scenario. Rarely can I get done eating by that soon. But the past yeah. couple of days, I was able to get done by 6, and I didn't eat until, like, 11 o'clock this morning just because I was busy again. And I like to go into my workouts with a good solid fast, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be too depleted going in them either. So that's a whole different ball game too. But that brings up a good point to um, when to exercise in conjunction yeah. with this whole thing. What's your take on that, Mr. Mr. Mark Testa? Well, uh, and you're more the expert on this, but certainly when to exercise in a fasted state, first thing in the morning. Correcting window. Correct right. Window. It doesn't have to be high intensity type stuff. It could be moderate intensity for 20 to 30 minutes. And then, as we've talked about, and uh, don't eat right afterwards. Yeah, right. right. Do not eat right afterwards. So what happens when you exercise fasted growth hormone increases and will stay elevated, you know, until you eat because insulin blunts it and drops it off. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do want some growth hormone, especially as we're getting older. And, you know, you do want the benefits of your workout and, and that your muscles are repairing and rebuilding. Um, so, you know, I saw a guy in the gym yesterday. He had like eight different containers of stuff oh. and pills <laughs> and powders. <laughs> and he was loading and he was taking it out there. And oh. I knew he was going to slam some right afterwards. And I was like, you know, to each their own, but not yeah. the way we recommend it. What are your yeah. thoughts on it? Oh, there's, there's so many misconceptions still swirling around. I'm stoked because I'm going to FitCon tomorrow and Saturday it's down here in Salt Lake City. It's a big, huge fitness exposition that comes to town. Cool. Drew Manning is going to be down there. Um, uh, I don't know. There's a couple of pretty known guys. I'm not, I'm not paying for like the big ticket thing to see these guys. I know all this stuff already. I, I, I could be the one talking. I should be the one of the ones talking. But anyway, I know they're going to be down there. They're pimping keto. Keto is like the big thing. Keto cookies, keto pancakes, keto pre-workout, post-workout, protein powders, all this stuff. You know what happens when you drink a protein shake, powdered protein shake? Your blood sugar goes bang through the roof, through the roof, and it's protein. Protein affects glycogen levels in your system. It, it affects blood sugar. When it's a protein yeah. shake and it's a powder, even if it has a, a fake sweetener, if you get a GNC, it's going to have acetylene potassium and junk sweeteners and artificial colors in it. If you get it at Whole Foods, it's going to have stevia or a natural sweetener. It's better than GNC's version. And yes, I'm calling names because it's, it's fact. I'm not lying. But it's still going to spike your blood sugar. So these, these guys that you're describing about your guy in the gym there, so what he probably does is get to the gym. He opens up a shaker cup. His arms are so big, he's probably doing it like this. And his neck is probably like that. Not that I'm judging bodybuilder types. But he probably takes out C4 or some noxious pre-workout formula, puts two scoops in. It's 
puts it in a shaker cup. You can smell it. And whenever I see someone doing that in the gym or in the locker room, I literally start sneezing because I breathe in the fumes and I, I run out and there's no way I can clean my, nos my nasal passages and I'm scared because I'm getting such toxic, nox noxious fumes in my system. So they put two scoops in, they put water in, they shake it up. It's toxic blue color. It looks like some kind of uh, antifreeze or something. You can smell it throughout the whole gym. They slam it. Then after the workout, they get their, their big tub of protein powder and they put three scoops of protein powder in the shaker cup and they shake it up and they slam that. I just got 66 grams of protein, look at me. And they march on out of the gym, a big smile on their face. Then, an hour later, after the golden window of time, they go and eat this huge meal. Big scrambled egg, stir fry, avocado, bacon, keto this, and blah, blah, blah. Wow, they've committed so many cardinal fitness and nutrition sins right there, I can't even tell you. I can't even begin to tell you. The bottom line is this. I've been working out in a fasted state for 20 years plus probably. It is the best thing I ever did. I will never change, and I highly encourage all of you to do the same thing. And Mark said something very valid. Now, there's, there's ways you can tweak it. There's, there's like nuances involved. And if you work out in a fasted state first thing in the morning, and you did like 20 to 30 minutes of moderate activity, your metabolism will shoot through the roof. And then right. if you wait till later in the afternoon, approximately three or four in the afternoon, according to the circadian rhythm, you're at right. your strongest point, strongest, like physically strongest, between like three and four. So if you saved your beefcake workout for the afternoon and you waited four or five hours before that workout since your last meal, that's a small, that's, that's a partial fast, I call it. So that's going to benefit you too from a strength level. However, just know this, if you fast for 12 plus hours and work out first thing in the morning with nothing but water in your system, your growth hormone is going to be high and your insulin levels are going to be low when you start that workout. High growth hormone, low insulin level is a favorable spot to build and maintain lean muscle mass. I am a proof in the pudding. I've been doing it for years. So ideally, that's why I shift my windows to the way they are. So I'm usually about somewhere between 10 and 12 hours fasted before my workout starts. And don't, don't drink a shake before your workout. Don't have a banana with peanut butter. Don't have a cup of yogurt or whatever your spin instructor told you to eat or drink. Don't do it. Don't, period. Go in there fasted. Drink a ton of water. If you're hungry, celebrate. That is a good thing. Right. If you go in, if you go into your workouts slightly hungry and slightly dehydrated, your growth hormone is going to be high, your insulin is going to be low, and you're going to mop up. You're going to make bank. You're going to burn fat like you wouldn't believe. Your growth hormone is going to get spiked. And then when you're done eating, don't suck down the protein shake. Don't go out to, to breakfast with your friends. Then you want to wait an hour after the workout is over and allow your growth hormone to stay elevated where it slightly comes back down after one to two hours. Then eat your meal. Then you're good to go. That is a secret sauce. That's a trick of the trade. And that's my take on when to exercise. So you asked me that what it was and there it is. You know, I, you brought up something I want to mention, keto, right? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. keto is not eating keto food. That's not keto. That's processed keto. <laughs> keto. Keto is what we're talking about. Keto is going hungry and having your body burn fat to re release ketones. Correct. So you, you know, you, that, that is the jump start to getting into ketosis. It's not eating for periods of time and training your body to burn fat. Now, you can eat food that keeps you in ketosis, Correct. and those would be very, very low carbohydrate foods. But it is not eating keto pancakes and keto cookies <laughs> and keto <laughs> snacks is not keto it's, it's, a, it's not a, putting you in ketosis it's not it's not the natural ketosis no it's it's it's, uh, it's crazy artificial artificial means so to speak it's like it's kind of like taking steroids to get big and muscular it's a it's a cheap way in it's it's like not ha it, it's not doing the the necessary steps to get yourself where you need to be yeah not get not getting yourself fat adapted it's like giving yourself the the opportunity, like this whole exogenous ketone thing too. Anything exogenous means it's coming from outside the body. It's not produced internally. I don't buy into that even. I don't care how clean the MCT oil is or whatever. You're still like, you're trying to force your body into something. It's not natural in my opinion. I always say take the natural route. Did you see the talk yet from uh, Peter D'Agostino? He talks about some of this. and I haven't you know, gotten to him yet, no. Uh, it, it, it's a good one. He's a big ketone MCT, you know, researcher, University of Central Florida. Uh, good talk. I, I, I'll, I won't spoil it for you, but we should oh, come you. back and talk more about exogenous ketones. There are some studies that show that 
ingesting them does not necessarily get the body to do it itself. In fact, it might do the opposite. Like, why's the body got to do it if you're giving it to me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I yeah, think, right. Yeah, I, I think I think the jury's a little bit still out on that. Now, if you're fasted and you need a you want a, a boost of uh, brain ketones, then ingesting them might be beneficial if you're already in a fasted state. But you know, being not fat adapted and taking ketones is not going to do anything except maybe give you disaster pants. <laughs> and we're not even going to get into what disaster pants are. We can really draw <laughs> that, that's, a, uh, that's a Dave Asprey term I've heard him use a few times. But, um, but you know, all, all, all this, again, I want to bring this back home. All this comes down to losing that belly fat because that belly fat is releasing an enzyme called aromatase, which is right. breaking down your testosterone, which is at, a, at 50 already declining. And if you're breaking that testosterone down it's con with aromatase, it's converting into estrogen. So what is estrogen going to do for a male? Man boobs, yep. erectile dysfunction, loss of muscle tone, loss of confidence, um, and you know, it, it's not, it's not what you want. The blue pill is not going to overcome all those things I just mentioned. And then the inflammatory chemicals released from that belly fat are going to cause, um, destruction of the microcirculation in the penis. So even if you are taking the blue pill, it's going to have diminishing returns as long as you got that belly fat releasing inflammatory chemicals. The whole conversation here is about shifting to becoming fat adapted, burning ketones as fuel, eating better, and using fasting as a technique to accelerate that. And then we jump into how to eat, which is a strategy that we use for forms of fasting. So whether it's time-restricted feeding or whether it's a 24-hour fast or whether it's a 48-hour water-only fast or whether it's a fasting mimicking diet, we incorporate all those together. You can do that on your own. That accelerates the whole fat metabolism. That accelerates after 48 hours autophagy or the original cellular detox that after about three or four days with a fasting mimicking diet stimulates stem cell production, stem cell release, um, and rejuvenation. So you can see fasting has a lot to do with ketosis. It has a lot to do with uh, reducing inflammation, reducing body fat, reducing insulin, and just overall, uh, maybe, maybe an anti-aging, maybe a healthy longevity um, way of living. And that's what we want. Like, I want to be 110 and uh, get up and just fall down dead. <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't want to take a pill every day for the rest of my life until I die. And that is how Western pharmaceutical works. That's how Western medicine works. I was just talking to a nurse about it. People think they're cured of their diabetes when they get on medications and insulin. And they're not. They think they're cured. They're yeah. not cured. They still have diabetes, and if they went off all their medications, they'd still be diabetic, but they're not yep. cured. It's interesting how so many people think, oh, I'm on, I don't have high blood pressure. I'm on medicine. I don't have diabetes. I'm on medicine. Yeah, you still have that. Yeah, or, or you wouldn't need the medication. Hello. <laughs> or you wouldn't need the medication. Hey, listen, I'm running out of time here, but what do you want to say about uh, our strategies of how to eat? Oh, well... Uh, you, you mentioned a couple of the points already. Try to keep your meals in an eight hour or in an hour window of time that you eat them. Try to include prebiotic foods in your meals, which would be asparagus, onions, leeks, bananas, oats, um, chicory root, artichokes, Jerusalem artichokes, that is. Foods like that. Try to include those in every single meal you eat. And if you only eat three, it's easy to get them in there or eat two out of the three. And no snacks in between. So the average person in America eats 17 meals a day. So anytime you have something that has calories, if it's two peanuts or if it's a swallow of sweetened tea, it's considered a meal. Anything that has calories that's going to affect your blood sugar is considered a meal. That is an eye opener. 17 times a day, the average person. I want you all to don't change a thing. Count how many times you eat for the next week. 
every single day. And if it's a swig of something, a Hershey kiss at work, it's a meal. Count it. 17 times. I think it's Hall, it's uh, Netherlands, I believe. Seven times a day they eat. And they check the, the, the health levels between Americans and them, whoever it was. They talked about this in the seminar. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. But their health was through the roof and our health was whew, through down the basement. The tank, through yeah. the basement. So honor those rules at all times and do what works best for you. And if, if nothing else, remember this, wait an hour after you wake up till you eat and try to separate your last meal before you go to bed by two hours and make sure you have a 12 hour window in between. That's a simple thing right there. Yeah. So that's my take. Good stuff. And, and make sure to go to Pine Pollen Superfoods website and get rebuild because we have a fasting and fitness protocol already built into it. It's a 12 week program. You can't go wrong. And in the meantime, let us know if you want to do our next reversing middle age pro pro um, protocol as well. Mark and I are going to be starting another one soon. Yep. And that's more <laughs> in detail about what we're doing. It's a 12 week program. We meet with you yep. every week for an hour. You learn. Personally how... meet with you too. We don't yeah. just like spout off at the mouth of Facebook. <laughs> you, you learn how to take this stuff and make it your own because, again, yeah. we want sustainability. And you'll learn a lot of different things about health. We have a 30-minute Q&A every week. We share our meal plans. We share our meals. Kevin gives you an awesome exercise workout. Um, there's a lot of additional uh, information, education, and free resources that come with the Reversing Middle Age program. So if you want to get involved in that and uh, really have some supervised fasting and experiment with the 24, 48, and five-hour fat, five-day fasting mimicking diet. Um, we will guide you effortlessly, yep. and you know, you'll be like my friends who, three or four months later, are still yeah, awesome, super thin, cholesterol's great, feeling awesome, and as grateful as anybody I've seen. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right, closing ceremonies, folks. This is K. Rail reporting live from Park City. Dr. Mark Tesla from Denver, Colorado. Yep. Make sure to get that belly fat off. Hit us up if you have any questions or comments. And always do at least one thing beyond your comfort zone every day. Always live in the present moment. And also hug at least five people every day and also pick up at least one piece of trash. That's not asking much. That's right. Boom. All right, man. Good All to right. see you. All right. Later, everybody. Okay. See you.